Welcome to the SIBA Lunchbox podcast. Hello and welcome to this special episode of the SIBA Lunchbox podcast. This episode is a compilation of interviews carried out by some of the podcast team members at an ecology conference in December 2021. This conference was organised by the British Ecological Society and the French Society for Ecology and Evolution and was called Ecology Across Borders. We have some fantastic interviews with attendees of the conference who provide tips for first time attendees, as well as highlighting the diversity of careers available within ecology. We hope you enjoy it. So, hello, we are starting with Ben Williams, but this is only for the uh, pre-recording stuff. So, who are you in which state of your career are and which are your uh, research uh, topics? Morning, um, so my name is Ben Williams. I'm a first year PhD student at UCL. Um, and my research generally is looking at uh, coral reef habitats, in particular the soundscape of these habitats. So what we can learn from them by listening is my work at the moment. And then I'm hoping to move on to um, other questions here as well, looking at restoration. Um, so we've got a lot of potential projects lined up and we'll have to see where they go. Okay, cool, fantastic. Uh, what drives you to become a scientist in the first place? For me, I think it was that I always loved the natural world um, and you know, just the beauty that we see in this place. And so I was really interested to learn more about this um, and be able to help protect it and conserve it and experience it. Um, so for me, I think it's an amazing job to get to study this full time every day. Do you always knew you want to be a scientist or there was some kind of a shocking moment when you were a child and then you decided that, yes, this is what I want to do? I think it was a, a slow transition into realizing it's what I wanted to do for myself. So I um, thought about a number of different things when I was at school. I was convinced I wanted to be an astronaut for far too long. Um, hasn't happened yet. Who knows? <laughs> um, but yeah, then I was interested in things that could help other people. So I looked at maybe being a medical doctor. Um, and then when I started my A-levels at sixth form, we do in the UK, um, I got more and more interested in biology. I had some brilliant teachers who I think played a big part in that. Um, so that's when I knew that's what I, what I wanted to do at university. And quite quickly, I could tell I wanted to try and keep going into research once I'd started there. Nice, that's great. And what kind of advice can you give to uh, young researchers or young people that want to get into, into science? Yeah, I would say the key thing is to um, keep trying to find something that you're really passionate about. It's quite easy, I think, in science to um, miss a couple of opportunities that you may be interested in and not go for. And almost kind of go for another topic that happened to fall on your lap because it's often the way that it is in science I think you have to wait for the opportunities to come around and sometimes the wrong opportunity will come up at the right time or something like that but I would say whatever it is that really interests you um, just keep trying and you'll get there eventually so that was my experience as well and now I'm studying the, the habitats and the, the questions that fascinate me the most um, and that was for you a lot of patience in looking for those those opportunities to come around yeah vocation and passion are absolutely important to for this career uh, which are the best things and the worst things about being a scientist I would say almost the best thing and the worst thing at once for me at least being a PhD student but I think it's very true for being a scientist is um, you don't have to work your regular hours, you kind of, um, you're all consumed by it sometimes in your life and it's great because you're in control of what you do and when and there's all these different tasks coming about. So we're at a conference this week, might be doing field work another time, um, working on your computer plenty of time as well. But then also I do find there's often that, uh, the worst thing can be that overhanging pressure of, oh, I could just do a bit more work or um, not really giving yourself dedicated time off which I think is key so in terms of lifestyle for me I think those can be the best and worst things but there's so many other things to choose on like seeing how there's so many of us here today at this conference passionate about nature and the environment and we know to a large extent what we need to do to look after this but just banging your head against the wall when you know that we're not seeing the uh, the movement in the, the broader kind of industry and governments that it's going to make the difference. So that's probably the professional difficulty that I see. 
Well, Kevin, thank you very much for your experience. I hope to uh, see you soon on YouTube. <laughs> awesome. Hi there. So, what's your name? What stage are you at? And what do you work on? Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Emmanuel. Uh, I'm a third year PhD in Grenoble in France, and I'm studying rewilding in the French Alps. Wow, that sounds really interesting. So, a quick would you rather question. Would you rather be able to fly or live in the ocean? Um, rather fly, I think, so I could fly above the ocean and also fly in the mountains, which I love. Ah. Uh, very nice, very nice. So, I hear this is your first conference. What's been the most surprising thing about conferences and what's been the best thing that you found? Hmm. One thing that is both surprising and really nice is the networking opportunities which I wouldn't have expected to be as important as were. Um, what was the best? Um, going from lecture to lecture and seeing so many topics in so few time. It's really, really great. Brilliant. And have you always wanted to be a scientist? Um, not really, actually. I'm not seeing um, science as the ultimate goal of my career, but only as a one step among others, which uh, I use to continue in policy making afterwards. That's brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. talking to us today so can you tell me who you are what stage in your career you're at and what area of work you are in hi um, so my name is Tracy Evans I have I'm post a post PhD I work for DEFRA mm -hmm. um, so I'm I lead a natural science team um, informing the new environmental land management schemes so um, I work in across an interdisciplinary team so I lead natural scientists but we work with economists and social scientists so we're essentially feeding in evidence to develop policy Wow that's really exciting thank you for sharing that and what's the biggest challenge you have with your work Oh God so I think um, so essentially we're trying to ask um, answer policy questions and um, trying to I think the most challenging part is trying to condense really complex information into something really simple that ministers understand so for example trying to understand um, the impact of land management actions on different ecosystem services and then we're trying to present that in a way that's really clear and so ministers essentially just want to know the overall impact of an action on biodiversity so trying to kind of um, disentangle all of that information on um, the spatial considerations displacement effects and anything else like adoptions um, barriers to adoption of actions so trying to understand that and come up with an overall impact score really really complex and also trying to integrate all the different disciplines as well so being aware that it's really important to not to look at the environmental aspect but also the economic and the social aspect as well yeah why do people always just want one number or one I line i know it's <laughs> awful it's way too complicated yeah i know <laughs> i think it's quite difficult as a scientist to be honest coming into policy and trying to make that transition from something where you understand that black box but just getting rid of that black box and just presenting something really simple yeah okay so what's the most rewarding part of your work I think, actually, again, I think it's going back to that working with the um, different disciplines. I think being able to understand and, and get that appreciation for, for example, social science, which I just wasn't really aware of all of the kind of intricacies before and, and understanding how, how important it is, I mean, to understand behaviours to actually make any kind of change. So working in that interdisciplinary team, I think it's really rewarding and then using all that information to, like, bring everything together and I think again like yeah bringing all of that work together and, and looking at all of the complex work that you do for example and, <laughs> and taking it and bringing it all and mushing it together to then try and influence policy and, and seeing that change in policy I think is yeah, really that is fantastic awesome. brilliant so did you always want to work in policy definitely not no, <laughs> no I like, question myself every day uh, no I, I loved working in academia I, I kind of got into policy a bit by accident um, but I'm, re I'm really enjoying it I think when you look on a day-to-day -day basis about decisions that are made with the evidence that you kind of feed in yeah I really enjoy it but no definitely I never even knew it was an option to be honest yeah it's tricky trying to figure out what jobs are available how to get into them would you have any advice for people that might be interested in going into policy um I would actually advise to look into doing the post fellowship um I think that's so I never did it I know a lot of people who work in the civil service did it um I think it's just a useful insight to see um I guess what's involved um I think also just trying to 
speak to people in policy because it's a very different um, work environment. I mean, I love I love both academia and working for policy, but they're they're totally different work environments. So someone who just loves the, to get into the detail might not like going into policy, but yeah, I think it's. Good, a good opportunity to explore. Yeah, great advice. And we're at the Ecology, Ecology Across Borders conference today, so pretty big conference. What are your favourite things to do with conferences? Oh, I think meeting people, to be honest. I'm, I'm so out of the game now, working in policy, that seeing people who are doing some really interesting research and speaking to them and actually getting to... I mean, you, could, you can listen to talks online, but getting to actually then follow up questions, I think, is really great. Yeah, and the most challenging thing to do with conferences. They can be a bit stress- stressful. <laughs> yeah, do you know, I think just moving between, between talks and walking in, at, when you get to the bottom of the, the bottom of the conference room and then walking up in front of everyone, yeah, I think that's probably the most challenging. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of cringe moments yeah. at conferences, I think. <laughs> okay, some really important questions now. Would you rather have reindeer's antlers or Santa's beard? Ooh, um, <laughs> reindeer's antlers? I think the beard might be a bit itchy. <laughs> Yeah, yes. good point. Yes. Might be difficult getting through doorways, though. Yeah, yeah true. <laughs> OK, if you had to listen to one Christmas song forever, what would it be? Oh, God. Um, oh, I think that would be awful. <laughs> um, jingle bells? <laughs> Quite repetitive. Just, yeah. It be good. <laughs> OK, and at a conference, would you rather give a presentation or a poster? Oh, God. Presentation, because posters you have to stand there for ages. And <laughs> While everyone else is drinking the free wine. Yeah, and the worst thing is and then when people walk past your poster because they're really not interested at all. At least in the presentation, you can just you can assume that everyone's interested. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tracy. No worries, thank you. Hi there. So, what's your name, what stage are you at, and what do you work on? Hello, I'm Hong Mei Chen. I'm a research associate at Lancaster Environment Centre. I work at the how biotic and abiotic factors interactively influence the soil carbon stability in the context of climate change and land use change. Wow, that sounds really interesting. Um, so, now a would you rather question. <laughs> would you rather have a monkey's tail or a rhino's horn? Of course, a monkey's tail. There's a monkey king in Chinese story, and uh, he can have like 72 changes. That's amazing. Fantastic answer. Okay, so we're at the last day of the BES conference now. What has been your best bit about the conference? Yesterday I got a coffee mug with all this butterfly illustration from this uh, Oxford Press stand. <laughs> Fantastic. And lastly, when you're not doing science, when you're not at a conference, what are your hobbies outside of work? It's a rather silly hobby. I watch a soapy, like a TV series, very silly. No, that's great. Everyone needs a switch off. Thank you very much. Thank Hello, thank you both for joining me at the BES conference today. Um, we're just going to start with some nice easy questions. So if you'd like to tell me who you are, um, what career stage you are at and what your research area is. I'm Galena Yunson. I'm a PhD student based at the National History Museum, but I'm also affiliated with Imperial College London and the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Brilliant. And what's your research area? My research area is that I... Okay, can I start with the problem? Yes, you can. So the main problem <laughs> is that we basically don't know much about biodiversity before the 1970s. So I'm trying to use data from the 1970s onwards and combine it with data from natural history museum specimens. Fantastic. And extend biodiversity time series backwards in time. Awesome. <laughs> And how about you? Who have we got over here? Uh, hello, I'm David Shen. Uh, right now I'm a postgraduate research assistant at Yale University, but I recently completed my undergraduate uh, studies at University College London. Brilliant. And what's your research area at the moment? Oh, um, so right now my research work is mostly focusing on species distribution modelling um, as part of our 30 by 30 initiative. So. Most of my work revolves around running uh, species distribution models for North American plant and animal species at one kilometer resolution. Um, 
yeah, very big scale stuff. Very exciting. Very scary also. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you both. So what are some of the major challenges that you have come across with your work? Galina, we'll start with you. Getting into the heads of Victorian collectors. <laughs> <laughs> so I formulate models that try to account for the biases uh, of Victorian collectors. Say that. Brilliant. That's a really good answer. I guess, uh, yeah, David, your work's very computational as well by the sounds of it. Is that yeah. a, a similar challenge? That um, <laughs> well, there aren't any Victorian collectors in our <laughs> no, thing, but models. Our thing, but our, <laughs> we have a modelling workflow which is incredibly inefficient and it's definitely being used way outside of what it was originally designed to do. So a lot of what I'm trying to work on is trying to optimise it to use less memory, run a bit faster because some of our models take several days to run. Wow. So, yeah, two people with some great modelling skills here by the sounds of it. So learning that must have been quite a challenge. So, David, how did you find learning these new skills? Um, well, I originally learnt a lot of my computational things through my undergraduate at UCL. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a lot of practice using R, and the workflow we have right now is written in R. So right now, it, it, the... the Get it. It's more of getting a, getting to grips with the code people before me wrote, um, trying to untangle what everything is doing, and yeah, just Amazing. trying to understand. How about you, Galina? Uh, I was quite lucky in that I had, uh, so I used quite a bit of R as well. Um, I was like in having a lot of R courses during my undergrad and then you know, going into my masters where some had more experience uh, and then some had none. Um, but more recently, I'm very grateful to you, Charlie, because ah, much, of, so special. <laughs> much of the models uh, that I'm working on are kind of like uh, extensions of what you were doing during your PhD. So I um, like it. Improving on them. Very good. <laughs> Furthering them for other applications. <laughs> Amazing. So would you both give um, anyone any specific tips if they were kind of learning R or learning how to use these complicated models, perhaps for the first time? Yeah, any advice? Give yourself some slack. You are literally learning a new language. Um, so I've done quite a bit of um, teaching assistants, um, graduate teaching assistant position roles, um, especially with learning R. And some of the students are just like terrified when they see this, this, this yeah. the script. It's like hieroglyphs and that it is a different language. They just give it time it will sink in absolutely very good advice there um my advice is just get in as much practice as you can um and don't worry about not knowing what uh to type because i think when you learn a language it's more about knowing what to google rather than knowing what to type absolutely oh hell yeah we've become google experts yeah. <laughs> <laughs> excellent so what would you say then is perhaps the most rewarding part of your research or your research career so far? Um, I think the most rewarding thing with my work I've been doing now is when I finally get um, at least 90% of my sort of taxonomic groups finished. Then we can finally produce these really nice um, richness and rarity maps um, for I don't know, all butterflies in the North America or all odonates. Um, yeah, and that's, that's a big step forward because then we can actually start doing some analysis with it rather than sitting and waiting for models to run. Big feeling of accomplishment, yeah, I reckon. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and Galina? Um, so one thing that I think we can all agree about PhDs is that there are some lows and it never exactly turns out the way you planned it. Always. <laughs> and I'm right now in one of those phases where I'm like, oh God, nothing works it does it, it will do eventually but i uh, i would say so therefore i will avoid talking about my research specifically because right now you know i love it it's my it's my love project but it's not but, all about that <laughs> but it's all the like outside bits like getting to go to cop 26 wow you know something i would have never dreamt of like even I didn't even knew that I wanted it, you know. <laughs> uh, and all of these other opportunities that come along with doing this uh, 
<laughs> yeah, there's always some random opportunities that come up in academia and it's nice to have some variety for sure. So we're at the BES conference just now. Do you have any advice for people that might be coming on to their first conference perhaps? What, what would you do or what would you um, recommend that they do to help with networking perhaps or getting the most out of their conferencing? Um, I remember my first BS, which, well, in, in person, which was, which was just two years ago, and it was so overwhelming. And I want to say that it is okay to sometimes just go to the loo and have some time for yourself, um, if that's what you need. You don't have to always be out there and be productive and, you know, feel... <laughs> Feel what your body needs and what your mind needs. Um, but yeah, yeah. Very good advice. Take a moment to breathe. <laughs> exactly, because <laughs> it can be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And how have you found things, David? Uh, well, this is actually my first BES and my first conference ever. So wow. it's it's definitely been a little bit overwhelming, but um, I don't know. Advice to other people is just go to as many events that you feel comfortable going to because I that we had a social yesterday that I didn't really want to go to but I went anyway and it turns out it was a blast and I yeah definitely don't regret going amazing great advice thank you okay a couple of fun ones to finish off then quick fire round Galena would you rather have a monkey's tail or a rhino's horn monkey's tail <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> nice answer. <laughs> and David, would you rather be able to fly or breathe underwater? They're kind of the same thing, because breathing underwater is just flying underwater. That's true. It would probably feel similar. Yeah. I go for <laughs> flying, though. Uh, everyone always goes for Everyone always goes for flying. flying. <laughs> okay. How about um, at a conference, would you rather give a presentation or a poster? Presentation, although it's so much more scary, it's more rewarding as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. And okay, David, would you rather be out networking or perhaps hiding in a corner? <laughs> um, depends how I'm feeling, sometimes both. Definitely, <laughs> I think that's the right answer. <laughs> Amazing, thank you so much both of you and enjoy the rest of your conference. Yeah, thank you very much. What's your name, what stage you're at, and what do you work on? Uh, hi there, my name's Karen Deep Sidhu. Uh, I'm just starting my second year PhD, uh, PhD at the University of Aberdeen, and I work on the role of sexual selection and facilitating rapid adaptation to climate change with very needles. Sounds fascinating. Now, a quick would you rather. Would you rather have reindeer's antlers or Santa's beard? Oh, they're both so good. Um, Reindeer antlers, I could like put things on them, I might not need a bag. I could decorate them yeah, all year round. Exactly. Love it. Okay. Now, I already know this isn't your first conference, mm -hmm. so what is your top tip for someone who is at their first conference? I mean, I know it sounds cliche, but don't be afraid to go up to talk to people. It's going to be like hard the first time and maybe the second time, and then you'll be like, oh, everyone's so nice, everyone's so lovely. Make use of all the workshops and uh, try and book some socials in because it will really help you feel more comfortable when you see some, some familiar faces as you're going around. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And then lastly, did you always know you wanted to become a scientist or work in ecology? No, I started with like anthropology, uh, so quite different, and then did more like evolutionary stuff and then kind of retrained with evolution and ecology. So it was this big like roundabout way of coming to ecology, but it's fascinating like the eco-evolutionary interactions and stuff. So yeah, it's very fascinating and I enjoy it thoroughly now. Yay, that's what we like to hear. Welcome to the Sea River Lands Road podcast. We are here with Oscar Rodriguez de Rivera Ortega. So, who are you? In which uh, state of your career uh, you are right now? And what's your research area? I'm Oscar. I'm junior lecturer in statistics at the University of Kent. I'm quantitative ecologist. And I am applying a spatial temporal model, so spatial temporal approach to different ecological data. So quantitative ecologies, you, 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 uh, you said, what does exactly mean? 
So try to understand through statistical or mathematical formula uh, complex uh, systems or complex ecosystem, uh, complex process in the ecosystems. So you are translating the natural world into numbers and then trying to get meaning from those numbers, right? Yeah, the idea is, yeah, use, as you say, use the different formula, different approaches to, uh, to, to get a numerical output of, for example, the distribution of a species or the relationship between a species. Do you always knew that that was the thing that you want to do, uh, wanted to do during your professional career or you just keep changing from subject to subject? I changed a lot. So when I was a student, I started with industrial engineering, and then I moved to forestry engineering because I was more interested in forestry. But also I love the technical part, so the engineering part. And during the, my process in, in my degree, I realized that I can do research. So I started to study in statistics because I thought that this my way to understand the ecology or to understand or in that case was the forestry and from them i'm now quantitative ecologist <laughs> when did you decide to become a scientist to become an expert on on numbers and and that kind of stuff so when i was finishing my my degree i uh, i was in a really old-fashioned school and i thought that uh, research was like an excuse to go to be in that university doing anything. But then I moved to another university with younger people. I saw what the, what the actual researchers or actual lecturers and professors uh, were doing. Uh, and I think what, that was the moment. So moving from, from do technical stuff to more scientific stuff. And, yeah. What are the tools or which are the, the things that a scientist need, needs to have in your opinion? The essential thing is curiosity and, I don't know, trying to understand, trying to solve puzzles through trying different approaches. I think it's the essential thing, curiosity to solve these puzzles. And what are the best things and the worst things about being a scientist? The best thing for me is I'm doing whatever I want. So. The good thing with being quantitative ecologist is you have the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of people, so you learn a lot. The bad things I think is we already have is the deadlines, uh, looking for money <laughs> to do the research. And also writing papers, right? That's kind of the, <laughs> that's kind of the worst things about being a scientist. Yeah. And if you have to advise anyone, an early researcher or someone that wants to get into science, what will be your personal advice to them? The first thing is read a lot. And the second one is don't be shy. Sometimes the senior lecturers and your uh, researchers look like really high level, but most of them are really approachable. So drop an email, make a call, try to have contact with as much people as you can to learn. And what are you looking for for the future in your career? What kind of research is getting you excited right now? I'm, I'm now I'm working a lot of with spatiotemporal models or the statistics. So I think I want to stay in that area. Obviously, I want to have a permanent position. <laughs> that is something that everybody wants. But I'm really open. I don't want to be. I'm, since I finished my master in biostatistics, I'm like improvising, so I'm still doing that. So just the only thing is being in a place that is uh, open to collaborate or with different researchers, and it's the only thing that I'm looking for. I think that's all more fun than just focusing on one thing, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, Oscar, thank you very much for, for your time, and I hope to see you soon on YouTube. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining me today for this mini episode of the SIVA Lunchbox podcast. Please, can you tell me who you are and what you do? Sure. So, um, my name's Lucy. I'm a researcher with the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, which is a, like a small NGO that focuses on wetland conservation um, and wildfowl. So, basically, wildfowl are ducks, swans, geese, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm with the Ecosystem Health and Social Dimensions Unit. So, it's kind of the people side of conservation more than the animal side. And I'm quite recent. I've only just started there, so I've been there two months. Amazing. Thank you so much. So, 
I know you've only just started, but can you imagine or do you know what the biggest challenges are going to be working perhaps with people and wildlife together? Um, well, I think so for me, I, I have a natural sciences background. Um, so I did marine biology at uni and then marine biology for uh, my master's. So for me, the biggest challenge is like learning this whole new social science, qualitative data, qualitative data methods. Um, so it's just like a steep learning curve. Um, but I think that's quite exciting. I feel like that's typical of any kind of science job. Like, yeah, you know, I think we're always trying to learn something new and thinking we don't know what we're doing. Yeah, and having to pick up a whole new skill set um, with very little guidance and a um, lot of reading. Um, so I think for me, uh, at the moment, that's my biggest challenge. But I'm quite excited at the the prospect of sometimes I feel like science can be quite especially during the pandemic a bit isolating and you can kind of get in your own bubble so it's it's quite nice to be doing focus groups and interviews and and getting to know people and seeing the the kind of the bigger picture around conservation because I think it's quite easy to get focused on like species numbers and population declines and looking at just the, the the data and it's like a whole different kind of opens your eyes to this whole different side to conservation because like it just doesn't work really unless you engage with people and like people are behind it yeah I think absolutely it's yeah it's exciting I yeah think. we can get bogged down in the biodiversity side of things but actually it's very reliant on people and what people think so yeah 100 yeah great so what's the most rewarding part of your, of your work so far um so I think I, I'm lucky that I've been able to get involved quite early on with projects related to like human well-being. So there's a lot of work going on at the charity now um, about the kind of well-being impacts of being out in nature and specifically blue spaces. So we've got a restored uh, site called Steert Marshes and they've been doing a trial of something called Blue Prescriptions. So it's getting people with sort of mild anxiety and depression to come out to wetlands for like six weeks and do sort of a, a range of guided workshops and seeing if that has like a good a good impact on like their overall mental health um, and, and general well-being and being part of that and kind of seeing like the actual these like positive outcomes for people and like hearing their stories because some of them have very like very like dark and personal stories about where they were before and then have, have really found something valuable in, in being at the site and got really involved and are helping helping people now like they're in the facilitator role of trying to get people connected with nature again so that that bit's been particularly rewarding to kind yeah. of just see like the positive outcomes it has actually had on people um, wow yeah actual yeah. impact on people's lives yeah and being able to talk to like it's i think any anything in conservation like whether it's yeah like seeing like a species recover or uh, a site kind of get back to a healthy point is, is rewarding but it is it's nice to hear these stories i think like yeah. it's more personal brilliant thank you for sharing that so did you always want to work in the charity sector no i think i thought i wanted to work as like a researcher um but i, I mean there's like a lot of similarities i think with, between like charity like i'm still doing research within the charity like that's my actual job title as researcher and i'm working with people who have phds and did postdocs um so it's not too dissimilar but i think i i realized that i wanted to be working more at like the point of impact like maybe not so much being the person that is like thinking up all of these new exciting research topics that have never been thought of and sort of letting maybe these sort of real world problems inform the research we do and then and kind of working more yeah at the other end of that scale like implementing kind of this conservation work like so, so we I think we draw a lot on like you know the research that's going on in academia and all of this groundbreaking and cutting edge stuff about conservation and blue carbon and all of this really cool stuff but like I think there's a gap between that like, research kind of sitting there and then like being implemented in like a new blue carbon code or something like that and that's what the, the charity is more involved in so I think that's what that would, that's what made me want to leave and, and kind of work in the charity sector but uh, people move back and forth I don't think you have to like Absolutely. decide forever but, uh, yeah, fantastic so do you have any tips for anyone who might be trying to get into the charity sector or is interested but doesn't know where to start um, I mean I did a lot of volunteering um, and I think it's good to like especially in maybe in charity work more so than academia to kind of demonstrate that you've got these these skills like like stakeholder engagement and like yeah good communication skills like public engagement so I did quite a lot during my degree where I'd like work with like the local wildlife trusts or like local educational kind of uh, charities that were doing stuff with like youth groups or um, 
children and like so I, I was in Plymouth for marine biology and there was the Wembry um, I've forgotten the, the name of it now because it's, it's been a while since I did my degree <laughs> down in Wembry they have like a little educational centre and they do like rock pool rambles with kids so I used to have that and that um, and a few citizen science projects at the MBA the Marine Biological Association ran um, and then I did also do some like lab volunteering around but I went to a lot of conferences as like a volunteer and, and kind of met a few people like who were both in, in academia and then also outside and I think just being able to talk about skills beyond beyond just like hard hard skills like yeah like data analysis like being able to talk about ways that you've like uh, yeah facilitated kind of projects or, or worked more in, like on the education like or kind of implementation of certain things like th- those kind of softer skills I think potentially gave me the edge for this job I think because they were that was what they were most interested in like following up with me about it was like my volunteering experience with other charities and with like in education so yeah. Some great top tips there. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and we're at the Ecology Across Borders conference. And how have you been finding it so far? What, what are your kind of best and worst bits of conferences? Um, so I mean, I, I've really enjoyed it, and it's nice to like have an in-person conference again. I think, um, in a way, this is like a nice middle ground in that I think usually there's, there would be over a thousand people here, and it, it's it's kind of I think split between remote and in-person. But I've been to a few big conferences before as a like a volunteer, like some of the students, and I think it can be quite intimidating when there's so many people um, and so many different talks, and it's. Yeah, I think there's pros and cons to like smaller conferences where you can get to know people and then bigger conferences um, where there's just yeah hundreds and hundreds of people and you kind of don't even know where to start. So I think the best and worst part of conferences is like definitely the opportunity to meet people. Um, but then I'm, I'm still like, I get a bit intimidated by like these mixes where yeah, you're just thrown in. Scary. And like all these professors and big names and you, and you, you know, I'm just like, oh, don't say the wrong thing. Don't say the wrong what the, dumb what's the first thing you say? No, I know. That's it, isn't it? It's like breaking the ice. Um, yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, but no, it's exciting. I think once you've done a couple, you kind of just learn to like, if you're going to go to lines or like if you've seen someone's talk that's the best way isn't it it's yeah. like so always a good conversation really like starter and then they like you because you've just flattered them I think that's the way yeah. <laughs> true but flattery that's... always works yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> great and we're, we're pretty big on promoting a good work life balance at SIBA and, and on our podcast so what do you like to do outside of work to relax um, so I mean I've, I've recently moved to Bristol because that's where my new job is um, yeah. and yeah. I I've got back into scuba diving, so I used wow. to really like that. Um, I picked that up like during the pandemic. Um, and it's quite a nice COVID safe activity. So. Yeah, quite isolated. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have literally your own breathing apparatus you cannot mix. Um, <laughs> and then I do a lot of running. I think like getting outside and doing things, yeah, like that keep you active because like sitting at a desk all day, um, yeah, definitely can be a bit tiring sometimes. And I think things like that, like diving or like surfing, like things that you can go away for the weekend and just be like outside and like get everything out of your system are really nice. Um, yeah, sounds idyllic yeah. right now, especially. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some really important questions now then to finish off. What is your favourite Christmas song? <sighs> um, I'm trying to think of if, if I can think of something sub, slightly more rogue and not like, really basic. <laughs> um, I think. Oh, it's, I mean, Mariah Carey's. Oh, like, it's a classic. Uh, it's, it's I a know. Classic. <laughs> like, no Christmas party would be complete without it. Yeah, yes. Are you a Brussels sprouts fan? Yes. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. I used to have, like, at uni in my worst worst days, I just had, like, a bowl of Brussels sprouts <laughs> for dinner. Um, Brilliant. So, yeah. Okay, and if you had to have one or the other, would you rather have reindeer antlers or Santa's beard? Oh, um... <laughs> I think I'd, uh, maybe maybe I'd have um, Santa. I think the reindeer antlers would make it so hard to get on the tube and stuff. Like, <laughs> I think cheery. for Santa's beard, you could like you know embell- Like I, I really like the idea of like when people have um, beard accessories. Oh yeah. And they like put tinsel in the Jazz beard it up a bit. or like fairy lights. I've seen. Yeah, I think I could do something with Santa's beard. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. No, <laughs> Please tell me what your name is, what stage you're at, and what do you work on? I'm Stuart Negus. I'm, uh, I've just come into my third year of my PhD project, and I'm working on the community and population dynamics of sea turtles. Who doesn't love sea turtles? <laughs> so, would you rather have reindeer's antlers or Santa's beard? <laughs> that's, 
That is a tricky one. Because Santa's beard's pretty impressive, isn't it? So it is. It is. But having antlers is also quite impressive. <laughs> I guess it depends how big those antlers are. I suppose. Big. A stag's antlers. Oh, okay. Think about oh, well, yeah. Then, well, it's got to be the it's got to be the antlers, then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see that. <laughs> Okay, so I've heard this is your first in-person conference. Yeah. You have been to several virtual conferences. Yeah. So what's the main difference you found between them, apart from obviously one being in 3D? And what's the best thing about an in-person conference? I can tell you've had that answer before where you said <laughs> being in 3D. Um, it's just been really great to be able to actually, like... Well, I know it's... It's sort of the same answer, but it's seeing people and actually being able to engage with people because, you know, having started my PhD through this pandemic, it's all been virtual up until this point. So all you're looking at is a computer screen and I'm more like a, I like being, you know, expressive in person. It's really difficult to do that when you're um, just looking at a blank screen. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's kind of just what's been really good about it. I've been able to see people, like I've met yourself, I've met loads of other people here as well that are doing all kinds of really cool things, which, you know, being on the computer is really tiring when you're on there all day, um, whilst, you know, meeting people kind of breaks the day up really, really nicely. And free wine and free food. Oh yeah, yeah, help. yeah. Of course, that that <laughs> does help as well. Having all the all the all the freebies, partic yeah, particularly the wine, <laughs> the food. <laughs> okay, so did you always want to become a scientist? Yeah, I mean, from like day dot, I was pretty much. I mean, I'm doing sea turtles now, but when I was really young, I was obsessed with dinosaurs like really? to an absolutely unhealthy degree like I knew all of the species names I knew what they all looked like I could like if they were on the TV like you know as a eight seven eight year old I was like oh that's that one that's that one and my parents would be like how do you know all this at <laughs> such a young age um, but yeah I've just always been really fascinated with um, biology um, Particularly like marine biology, like as I've kind of grown up and like kind of realised where my sort of niche, no pun intended, <laughs> was. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, what the deal's been. It's been pretty much my whole life. Though. Brilliant. More or less. And then when you're not looking at sea turtles or travelling the world looking at sea turtles, because <laughs> I know you've been to some pretty cool places, what do you like to do outside of work? <laughs> Well, I can't really avoid the ocean, so I tend to go scuba diving uh, quite often. So, wow. like, uh, I was quite fortunate enough to be able to do a bit of scuba diving when I was doing my field work in Cape Verde, and that was amazing. Like, well, I mean, I saw turtles there, but there were there are other cool stuff in the ocean that I like. It's not just turtles, but yeah, I absolutely love diving, even if it's in a lake that's really, really, really muddy. Or like, the, like some of the reefs I've been to and some of the shipwrecks I've looked at. It's, it's so amazing. I love it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. No problem. Brilliant. Have a thank good rest you. of your conference. Yeah, you too.